Good morning, everybody, or afternoon, evening, whatever it is, wherever you are. I already got the time zone mixed up with, with our guest today, but uh, that's just purely me being stupid. And for some reason, I think Kentucky, Kentucky almost seems like it's in Europe. That's far east it is, but I guess, I guess it's not. And so, Sean, did you, uh, were you aware that Kentucky wasn't in the eastern time zone? For some reason, I always think that Kentucky is right below Ohio and we're in the same time zone. But it's so weird because there's parts of Indiana that wrap around um, Kentucky and I never understand it. it. It almost feels like sometimes people in Kentucky can go south to go into Indiana, which makes no sense to me because it's further, further west. So I don't know what's going on with that whole deal. Yeah, I don't either. But uh, <laughs> anyways, uh, before we get ahead of ourselves, this is uh, Off Track with Crothers and Vice. It's the weekly motorcycle um, uh, uh, pop podcast for Moto America. Excuse me, I'm a little tongue tied. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's, Sean, it's uh, Road America, good event. We got through that wow. one, and and we're we're on the verge of uh, of heading to the great state of Washington for our event at the Ridge. Yeah, I mean, Road America is always an awesome event to go up to. It's just you know, especially this year, it was just a crazy amount of people there enjoying life and you know those people those people sure do know how to have fun there's no doubt about that and you know we got loaded up on some good food when we were up there but uh yeah ridge coming up and you know we all think about last year and how it was 100 degree temperatures and i don't think it's going to be quite the opposite of that this year but i heard it's supposed to be maybe in the in the 60s which is a little more temperate for that time period in that in that area so um i guess i'm kind of i'm looking forward to that but i got to make sure i bring a jacket because i i don't do that often so. Yeah, I don't either. I kind of messed up a little bit with that at actually at Road America because it was uh, there was times when it got a little chilly and I didn't chilly. Yeah. And uh, we had that 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 the pre for some reason, the media center had the uh, the air conditioning like it was, you know, like we're in Florida or something because it was freezing in there. But yeah, I got to remember that stuff, too, because it will be it looks from all indications. It looks like it'll be normal Washington state weather, which is like, you know, 60s, mid 60s and Looks like we got some cloud cover here and there, but it doesn't, at least now, it doesn't look like there's going to be any rain. So that's good. But yeah, if you remember last year, it was just unbelievably hot, like, oh, like was record breaking temperature. And, and, you know, I, they're just not really prepared for it. I mean, I mean, there were places in town that didn't have ice and it was, it was kind of a, it was kind of an odd deal. So we won't have that again. I think that's just a once in a lifetime deal that we happen to stumble upon. But uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to going back there. It's uh, the track's kind of cool. It's a little different. Um, I think. Uh, well, let, let's bring Roger Hayden in. He's our guest today, and and everybody knows Roger, former racer, former superbike winner. Now he does our Moto America Live Plus. He's sort of the 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 only guy in the in the Live Plus team that doesn't rotate his way out every once in a while because uh, you know sometimes we have Jason Wygant, uh, we have Robbie Floyd, we have Michael Hill. And the one thing that stays the same is good old Roger Lee. So, um, Roger, welcome to to the show. And I guess we can start off by by talking about the the season so far. Is there is there been any real surprise for you? Is the what the Petrucci thing? Is it somebody doing better than you expected? Somebody not doing as well as you'd expected? Let's start out a little bit by talking about what we've seen so far. Well, I think the the biggest surprise so far, I think, would have to be Tyler Scott. Um, I know he's like always been super talented and we, we expected this, but I don't think that we expected it this soon. And I mean, not only did he, you know, win the race at Road America, but you look at other tracks like Virginia, he was right in the hunt to, to win. And, uh, you know, I think that was just a little bit of a surprise kind of being the, the lead guy over there on that team so far. So, I think that's a little bit of a surprise. And I guess with Superbike, the biggest surprise is just all the issues uh, the tight guys have had. We haven't seen that out of them, you know, but, I mean, it's always possible. But the start of the year was, was crazy, in my opinion, because after the first race at uh, Road Atlanta when Jake crashed, I mean, it was like, all right, well, championship's over. You know, he almost went down 61 – 60 points, I think it was, or 61, something crazy like that. And then you look at, you know, not three race weekends, but just three races later, and he's got it back down to 12 already. So 
that's been su- a little bit surprising. I think having the different winners in Superbike this year, I don't think has been that surprising. It's been really good. Um, but yeah, I think every class has been really exciting. I mean, for sure, if you just go watching all the races starting at Daytona, like most races have come down to the last lap run to the flag. Hey, Roger, do you, it's when you raced, you focused on your own program. And I kind of know this from other riders. I've never really asked you this, but I assume it's probably the same. You, you knew what the other riders were doing, but not a huge amount. But now that you, I mean, you definitely pay more attention to what's going on, not only in Superbike, but in every every class up, up and through and all the riders, you definitely pay more attention than you did before. And it's not like you didn't want to pay attention. You really kind of couldn't because you got it, had to keep your mind on your own your own program, right? Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, and then also now, too, just because, you know, with, with the work part of it is I'm watching every single session. So you kind of kind of remember and, and know exactly what it is. And also knowing the riders now and everything, social media has helped a ton with that. Yes. You know what I mean? Because everybody puts out their Friday report on Instagram or Facebook, how their day went. And, you know, it kind of gives you the – the information you need in a way and then also like i said watching all the 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 sessions so uh and also i i kind of pay attention because you know i want to have stuff to talk about i don't you know like new stuff to talk about i don't want you know we don't want to talk about the same stuff every single weekend because then people aren't going to want to tune in right yeah you know roger it's funny about you i you may remember this but towards the end of your career, when I was working for a brand that you weren't riding for, I would kind of secretly always tell you, you know, you're my, one of my favorite riders and you would always kind of go, I know that or whatever. So I had to keep it on under lock and key a little bit, but I got to blow a little smoke up your butt here because as, as much as I admired you as a rider, I, you're incredible as a, as a broadcast guy. It's just, it's, it's amazing. And even now, um, when you, we, you're a quiet guy, you always kind of have been that way and you still are, but when you're on that thing, you, you never run out of, you never get twisted for words. You never get a, a block of what to say. You always have something to say. Has that always existed in you? Have you always been what is kind of a talkative person that didn't really talk a lot? Is that, is that right? Or is that not right at all? No, actually, uh, oh, First of all, I want to go back to Paul getting the time zone wrong. Oh, there yeah. There's parts of Kentucky that's Eastern time zone. There so not totally in the wrong. But anyways, <laughs> back to the question. Good point. I'm clear that up for Paul. Thanks, uh, man. Thanks. Um, you're right. I am kind of a, a quiet person and not really talkative and pretty much kind of keep to myself a lot. So when I first started, you know, I have to like remind myself to keep talking, like don't just watch this session like I'm at home. And it was kind of hard in the in the beginning uh, to figure it out. But it's like anything else, the more I get used to it and, you know, sometimes they would come over the headset and, and they'd say, hey, be a little louder if you can. And just, you know, stuff like that. And it, it was, you know, just working at it and, and getting better and you know, like you said, having all that, all that information and, and, you know, like I actually put a lot into it before I go into a race weekend. So I have a lot to try to try to talk about and, you know, where we're not just stuck talking about, you know, dead air, like, you know, always go, always print out the results from the previous race. So for, for headed into Washington, I'll print out all the results for both races that, um, road america and then i'll print out last year's results from uh the ridge and then you know you can whenever you're talking it just gives you more information and more stuff where you're not feel like you're you know you have to start talking and make stuff up and running out of stuff to say because you know you can say oh this is a track that he likes last year he got you know two top fives or or whatever so i try to I try to prepare myself for that and also just keep working at it and get more confident. At first, I didn't want to talk because I was scared to death to make a mistake. 
you know, I was going to say something that sounded stupid. And then it was like, after a while, you know, I kind of realized, you know what, I talk all day, I'm going to mess something up. You know, I mean, it's just like racing, eventually you're going to crash at some point. So I don't want to make a ton of mistakes, but I know they're going to happen and I'm going to get something wrong. And now, you know, I'm okay with it. And some people, you know, text you and, and clean it up. So just taking, getting more, getting more used to it. And uh, it's about confidence really. And then, but yeah, it is, I do have to remind myself sometimes, not as much now, but in the beginning, like, dude, keep talking. Well, luckily you have guys with you that tend to talk more anyway. I mean, uh, you know, I think it's fortunate you've had, you've had, you work with three different guys, which I think probably makes it more interesting for you and makes it easier to talk about different stuff when you have different guys asking you questions. And it's also kind of cool. I think you're in that role, which I correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like to me, it's, it, it's, it's easier. Like when somebody's asking you stuff and you can, impart your wisdom on them rather than just have to keep spewing this stuff out like your partners pretty much their job is just to keep talking 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 and then they include you and ask you questions and then you bring some insight and I think that's probably the best way for you to that, that's the best job for you to have I think you're right it definitely makes it easier when they just ask the question because then you don't have to you know you don't have to come up with you know something you don't know you know and then it doesn't you know, you just, when they ask you a question, you just answer with what you did or, or your experience or, you know, what I think they're thinking. So it definitely makes it easier. And working with different people is cool because each person brings different questions. So it's different. But, and then also, you know, you get to learn from each person. And, you know, there's some things each guy does that I think that I, that I like. So I try to, take that with me and and you know try to copy off whatever that is that I think they do that that I like so and also all the people that we work with we all get along pretty good so you know it, that that helps now right, that, each other's uh, back. yeah and and also with with Robbie now we can kind of at a point where we can kind of give each other a, a hard time and <laughs> sometimes sometimes they're we're joking and sometimes they're serious <laughs> right <laughs> yeah that seems to work out well with you guys you've got that little bit of a banter now and <clears throat> nobody takes anything personally when you take a jab at them so that's always makes it more fun but so also sean you got to remember that he, roger watches a lot of other sports yeah, and I think that probably helps them as well. You know, if you're watching ESPN all the time and you're watching how football guys talk and how baseball and all that stuff, basketball, I mean, you're, 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 you're able to listen to like the top guys in the business every day, 24 hours a day now with the way that, uh, the way that television is. So, I mean, is that accurate, Roger? I mean, you, you watch a lot of that. You can't help but learn from those guys as well. Yeah. You know, I listen to like sports talk radio and, you know, I kind of take the stuff that, that I find that they're interesting at. I'll tell you one thing though, I used to be really hard on uh, announcers and broadcasters. Like, you know, I'd be like, this guy stinks. You know, they got to get a new guy. Right. And then I'm in there in a position and now I'm like, oh my God, this is way harder than I thought. Right. So I don't really complain about all the, these sports broadcasters like I used to because now I know how hard that, that job actually is. And then also, too, watching, like, MotoGP races, World Superbike, and all that stuff, you know, you just constantly kind of – you kind of learn, and that's kind of where I got the, the idea of printing the results from the previous race and uh, the race from the – where we're going from the year before because whenever I'm watching MotoGP or World Superbike, I kind of like that information. Like, is the track faster this year? Is it slower? You know, is this guy, you know – having a breakout race weekend or was he like really fast at this track last year you know stuff like that so that's kind of like what gave me that that idea and you know I think a lot of people like it because it kind of gives them a perspective like like they're there like oh man these these guys are like at Road America the twins guys were you know eight guys under the track record and 
you know, when you're watching that, you you can kind of see how all the Twins guys have really stepped up this year and how much more competitive it is. Now, there's one thing I think you I, – I, I think, obviously, you listen to our podcast, which probably expands your horizons and your knowledge of the sport oh. to a point where you can barely contain yourself. Oh, but yes. You've also got – you know, you've also got someone in – like myself – who actually like, I don't know if it's a dynasty or not, but I mean, I've won so many of your Supercross fantasy leagues now. And I've, I've actually, my tax bracket has changed and everything because now I have to report the winnings because they're so high. But I mean, does it, does it bother you that like I come in and win your fantasy Supercross like almost every year? <laughs> no, because you've donated enough of the years that when I won, I think it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a wash now, but I got to have everybody, all my buddies always ask me, who's in to win? Who's in? They don't know who it is. So right. I got to answer a lot of questions, but you did win the, the title this year. I'll give you, I'll give you credit on that. So um, I wish it was like a, I wish it was like a belt or a belt or something. I could wear like a big belt buckle that significant, you know, that t- told everybody that I was number one. Maybe you could work on getting one of those made. Oh, like a WWE belt. Yeah, there you go. That's what I need. Yeah, then right. you can just work that around. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you. I know it's not easy to be the uh, the the fantasy manager, and I, but I also know you took got everybody's money in advance, and you've got some kind of savings account where you actually make money no matter what. But I'll let that go. Well, I used to. I used to put it in the bank and you know whatever everybody paid and get the interest off of it for that three months but this year was a little bit of a a tough one so we didn't really didn't really get much interest off of it (laughs) there you go Raj I got like three three things I got to fire at you but one of them Paul's gonna love this one maybe you will too but we got to acknowledge the fact of today's Nick McFadden's birthday I just texted him (laughs) yeah (laughs) I love Nick McFadden so do I I do too. Yeah, he's got his own. He's got his own uh, business now. Him and a uh, one of his buddies started. He was flipping houses. Now him and his buddies started a a business. Sorry, isn't it? Yeah, like you know, laying concrete and a bunch of other stuff. And I think it's going really well. He acts like they're they're booked out for a while. And you know, I guess obviously they've made a couple mistakes in the beginning that was tough learning mistakes but yeah i think they got it got the ball rolling pretty good and already trying to you know look for more equipment and trying to find some some good help which i think is the the hardest part is finding some good employees right has has he totally made the transition away from does he ride with you guys anymore do you ever see him around or at all well he right well i don't ride anymore at all i need to get back to it he asked me every day actually he asked me yesterday to ride today, and you know I didn't even. I probably just remembered I didn't even reply. So I'm now I'm that guy. Uh, but sometimes he'll ride the flat track at uh, at uh, JD's house, or you know maybe a outlaw flat track race here and there. But for the most part, you know he's uh, it's for fun. I think sometimes he talks about maybe doing a twins race or stock 1000 race but i think now you know he's got this business and you know i think he's really focused on it and kind of knows that's what that's what's next for him right okay so i want to ask about you roger a little bit so let's go back to 2009 you had that terrible crash at barber and obviously you had you know fractures in your pelvis and you had that, the issue with your finger of course and then you know you had some obviously every rider ha- sustains injuries of some kind in their career and towards the end of your superbike career you had a shoulder issue so where are you at health-wise now do you have any lingering issues from any of that stuff at this point honestly not too bad I mean not, I mean sometimes when I get up I'm a little stiff but I don't know if that's racing or that I'm almost 40 years old <laughs> you know, so it's hard to tell. But to be honest, I had some big injuries, and I've so far I've been really, really fortunate to, um, to you know, not have any lingering issues at the moment. I don't mean that they won't come up sometime, but right now I don't have any big, 
big issues and then also the the shoulder that was bothering me now that I'm not riding and you know like going to the gym and all that stuff that I'm doing like you know like eight months later that, that kind of went away hmm. so you know if I was going to race again I'd probably have to get it fixed back then and would have been a, a long recovery but now now I'm not using it so much or at all you know it's you know when I'm fishing it's the other shoulder so you know it's not a <laughs> not have to get it fixed for the for the fishing so I, I you know i got lucky there but no for the most part i uh i've been pretty blessed to this point and uh you know i'm not sure what's going to happen in in a couple years but you know right now i'm i'm feeling pretty lucky god help us sean he's roger hayden's gone from professional racing athlete to somebody who gets sore fishing <laughs> <laughs> It's a strenuous some days, sport. Some hey. days it depends. It depends on how they're biting. And you know, if they're not biting very good, the shoulder does get sore from casting fifty-five thousand times and <laughs> just reeling uh, again. I I've had I'll tell you what. Last summer was my was my best summer fishing. And then I was like, dude, I can't wait till next year. I got a boat, I got all this stuff. I haven't caught hardly anything this year. So and it's so hot in Kentucky, I can't go at the moment. We're in the middle of a heat wave. So the heat index here with the humidity has been like 110 to 115. Oh, that's horrible. Yeah, it's insane. We got the same thing up here, and I heard George is bad too. I mean, everywhere it's it's pretty pretty hot. That's why getting up to Ridge is going to be nice. Um, hey, this wasn't one of the questions I was going to ask you, but since you brought up fishing, I've never asked you this before, but have you ever done any noodling? No, never. <laughs> and I, I, I don't know. I don't know if I'm if well for one I don't know anybody that does that around here but I don't know about sticking my hand I'm already missing one finger Sean so you know what what the hell's I mean noodling have... oh you get right in the water with the fish and you, somehow you grab the fish with your hands I, it's the weirdest thing I've ever seen no, so it, you go fishing in, in the water but shallow enough where you can stand and you just I mean like in a river or whatever it is it's the nastiest water and you just dig around for a fish and then they pull, I mean, you should Google it and they pull up like this biggest catfish you've ever seen. And they're just down there with their hands just filling around. Hmm, I think I'll pass. Yeah, I don't like catfish anyway. Those things are gross. I mean, they're ridiculous. Plus they got those, don't, I mean, up up where I grew up, we called them bullhead up in, in New York. I think they call them horn pouts in some areas, but um, those fish have horns on them. Does a catfish have any horns on them? Well, they're not horns. They got the 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 whiskers. gills or the fins on the side. They do have the whiskers, but they also have like little teeth where most fish don't, like real little ones that most fish don't have. But catfish are they're pretty nasty. I mean, I've, where I fish, there's some. Uh, I've caught a few pretty pretty big ones there, but I always throw them back. But they are they are. Uh, I like eating them though. I like fried catfish. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, catfish is pretty good to eat. You're right. But yeah, I don't want any part of anything else other than eating them. So, um, all right. So here's the other, here's my other question I want to ask you about. We So our tracks have have come up this year a little bit because of obvious reasons. And, you know, we, we talk about the tracks we go to and we do a pretty good job of going to tracks pretty much all around the country with Ridge. We've got now a couple tracks out in the West that we go to. And all of our tracks with the exception of Daytona, we are able to race on them in the rain. And we proved that at Road America, obviously we, we dealt with that. And, you know, it was pretty good racing on rain tires in that Superbike race too. But I wanna ask you about, I wanna go back to, you, well, you raced a little bit in Moto2 and some in, in MotoGP, but for sure you raced a full season with Pedercini back in 2010 in World Superbike. So you raced, you raced at all those tracks around the country like they talk about. And we have a track in Coda that MotoGP goes to, but just because Moto, uh, World Superbike or MotoGP goes to all the, tracks in Europe, which are each of those countries' best tracks, I would imagine. There are other tracks in those countries that maybe aren't quite the level of a MotoGP smooth as ribbon or whatever, but what was your experience when you went when you were in World Superbike that year? Were those like the best tracks you ever rode on? I mean, some of them were really great tracks, just like there's tracks here in the U.S. that I think are, are really great, and you know, 
MotoGP even is making changes to safety where riders are like, hey, we got to change this last year. I'm not sure what track it was. They, you know, said it had to be changed before they came back the next year. So, you know, they they have tracks too that, you know, not all of them are just this amazing made for motorcycles track. So I think everybody deals with that to an extent. And for us in the in the US where, you know, outside the US, like MotoGP and all those other series, motorcycles are like their bread and butter just about. You know, that's like what they're built for or F1 and, and all that. Like they build them with that in mind. In the US, our tracks are, are built for cars. And some people will do, do want to have motorcycles and they make it safer. But for the most part, people are making their money on, on cars. And that's why a lot of these tracks are built. And for us, you know, personally, I think safety has come a long way. Um, uh, you know, there's definitely, you know, some tracks that are probably maybe safer than others. But, you know, we don't have like 30 options and we're picking you know, the best 10. We And not that this makes it right or wrong, but we either go to the tracks that we go to, which I don't think they're that that unsafe. Obviously, there's some areas, some of them that could be fixed, and a lot of them have been fixed. But we don't have a ton of options. And, you know, it's just the way it is. And, you know, I mean, even like when we first went to the Ridge, I was, went to a school there, and, and, you know, Chuck Ashland was, calling me and texting me hey go look at the track go look you know go around with the track people so you know to to make it safer and they made a lot of changes to that you know to the track and then they made more to the next year and almost all the tracks that we go to now will is working with us to to make it safer and you know all the tracks we go to now you can you know like you said you can race in the rain where you know a long time ago we went to tracks where you couldn't race in the rain and it was always a big issue every time it came up so are their tracks so much better than ours some of them are, are but there i wouldn't just say every one of them is just you know every one of our tracks are, are dangerous or not fun our, i think the biggest difference for me is between the tracks is ours are are sometimes like a little smaller and a little tighter compared to maybe some of theirs. But Indy was pretty small and tight as well whenever MotoGP raced there. So the tracks are definitely different. And I think the biggest thing is theirs are built for racing and ours aren't. And that doesn't mean ours aren't safe because they are. I mean, if you just kind of, you know, I don't want to, to jinx anything, but, you know, if you just kind of look at the history of, of, Moto America, they have a, a, you know, safety is, we don't run into a lot of big problems. And I think that's the bottom line. I think that's what you, when you look to see if something's safe, I think the bottom line is you just go off the, the history, you know, how many people are really getting hurt or whatever. And Moto America is, I think is pretty safe in that regard. Mm. Yeah, you're 100 percent right, and I tell people the same thing. It's like if we if we were going to the ridge next week and we were putting 100,000 people in in the seats and and the place was packed and there was traffic going in and out and everybody was making a ton of money, you could go to those people the next year and say, "Hey, look, you know, you need to do this, 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 and and you need to spend a lot of money to make this happen and this happen." And those people would know they're going to get that money back plus more. They'd be more open to do it. But you know, it's just not. We don't have MotoGP size crowds and we don't have moto gp size money and in turn you know we have what we have and and like you said uh the safety record's not that bad and and we do everything we can every year to make even even little changes that will somehow make a big difference so and like you said some of the tracks we go to if we went up there and demanded you know big changes they would just say okay uh just don't come back next year we're not going to spend all that money for one event on the weekend when we have cars here four or five days a week and they have no problems. And, and I'm not saying either that 
we go to these tracks and they're unsafe, but that's all we got. So we have to turn the blind eye. I'm not saying that at all because, yeah, you know, this is all we have, but that doesn't mean that they're, you know, everybody's at risk every single corner. And I think as long as racing is going to be around, tracks will need to be updated and stuff like that as the speeds continue to grow in certain places, certain areas will become an issue. And, you know, they just got to, you know, kind of work with it as it goes. And if you have a problem with safety, you know, I had some problems in 2014 where I thought, you know, New Jersey was a little bit in the wet, it was super cold or whatever. And there was a lot of guys going down and I went to, to Wayne and Chuck and they heard me out. And I think, you know, I think that is the, the, the best thing to do is, you know, for any problem you have is just go to, you know, go to, go to the, the people that run it and talk to them. And I think you get more stuff done like that than, you know, bringing a lot of other people into the conversation. Right. All right. Well, let's jump around a little bit. Um, last, last week was Nikki Hayden day, June June 9th, um, I, when I look back at this and, and, you know, for those of us fortunate enough to consider Nikki a friend, it, it, and even it, it's, what amazes me is that he's, that, that it's taken off in such a bit, like the Nikki Hayden day is just one example, the foundation. I mean, he's so, it, uh, the impact he's had on so many people and, and it's not just people in the motorcycle racing world anymore. It's, it's, it's gone beyond that. Does that, do you sometimes just go, wow, I just can't, I can't believe what, what this has become and, and, and the impact and the legacy that Nikki's left behind. I mean, obviously it makes you feel really good. It makes you feel proud, but, but does sometimes you, does it just surprise you that it's gotten to the point that it has? It does because you don't, uh, because he's your, your brother, you don't really see that impact. You just see him as, as a brother. Because when he came home to Owensboro, where we hung out all the time, he wasn't, uh, and I think that's why he liked to come home so much. It wasn't like he expected to be treated different. You know, like when we lived together in California every winter, like we all had things that we were responsible for for the house, you know, like you know, chore wise, because, you know, it was just me and him and Tommy. So everybody had their own responsibilities. He didn't expect to have different, you know, responsibilities or whatever. So you just see him as another person, as a brother. And then now, you know, like, it's like, God, he really did impact a lot of people. You know, I knew he was, you know, big and all that. But as a brother, I think you don't really see it as much because you just see him as, as a brother, you know, somebody that you used to share a room with and, and all that, you don't really see that he's making an impact, you know, not only in the U S but all over the world. And, you know, so many people with, you know, 69 tattoos and people always asking to, if they can run number 69 and, and member of your brother. And it's just like, it's kind of amazing because you don't, you don't really see it and definitely didn't see it while he was still here. But now, you know, and then people are doing, you know, all over the world, we're doing different things on six, nine. Some people were having rides. Some people were doing other stuff. Some people, you know, ran 6.9 miles or, you know, rode their bike. So it was just, even though we had a big thing in Owensboro, which we're going to do every year, um, it's just crazy to see that it's all over the place. Yeah, it, it, it is. It's, and I have the 69 stickers on my, on my bicycles. And it's amazing that I'll just be riding, you know, in Orange County, California and, and be either on my mountain bike or on a road bike and, and somebody will see the stickers and go, oh, Nikki Hayden. And you're just like, wow, that's like, that's like crazy to me because it's not like motorcycle racing is this huge thing here, you know, it's just not. And for them to, to know what that is, and I've had my bike at the bike shop before and the mechanic, I almost feel like he kind of moved me up in the order of working on my bike because I had Nikki's sticker on there. So maybe I need to have like t-shirts and stuff too, so I could get maybe more free stuff or something. But 
he uh yeah. it's it, it does it always amazes me and I, I I thought it would be the same for you because like you said it's like to you he was just your brother I mean you know you threw dirty laundry at each other and you hung out in the same room and you rode motorcycles together and 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 but but elsewhere in the world it's just this turned into a massive massive thing now my next question and and it's sorry because it's also you know sad but the the passing of earl i i mean i'm i personally will uh, every father's day he would text me and say happy father's day and he'd have like a bunch of the little squirrel emojis on his text and I'm going to miss having that this year. But what what's it like, Roger, without having him there? He's such a he was such a lot larger than life person, and he he truly was like he was the Haydens. And it, is it is it is it radically different in in Owensboro now without him? Yeah, I think it's definitely definitely different, and something I think we're all adjusting to. Because, you know, for one, I was you know, live right by my parents. So as they got older, I, you know, did more stuff at the house, helping them out. But, you know, every time something would come up in life, you know, as a, as a boy, you go see your dad, mm -hmm. you know, and you're like, Hey dad, this, that, or you don't really have that. And this year we're kind of doing all the we're doing all the first this year, you know, we got his first birthday, you know, the first father's day and, and all that. So it's definitely different. Um, and like you said, just because his, his, his personality, like if you were around him, you were entertained, you know, like, you know, everywhere I went, somebody would be like, Oh yeah, I know crazy Earl. And you know, right. like your dad and tell some story and, so and all that and it's just stuff that that's different and, and you're gonna miss and uh you know I think that's why we try to include my dad in some of this uh you know Nikki Hayden stuff because we you know just uh because he did so much for for people and this and this city as well like charity wise I mean that was like his you know I mean heck he built a Hayden home for girls basically you know that was his his idea so it's definitely different and you know you can't sometimes I still go up to the house expecting to to kind of see him and you know and, and you don't and it's just kind of you know it was just a bummer because you just I, you know not just because he was my dad you know I love seeing him it was just he always had a story or something was always going you know like <laughs> it was somebody owed him money for a car or an apartment or, or I mean there was always something going on in a story and you know and it was just always entertainment and and then now that that that's gone but so yeah but we're getting used to it and uh but it's definitely definitely hard at least we the hardest part really was this this winter from like uh september to when he passed because we spent that in the hospital and like you know watching your dad suffer so much was like that was that was the hardest thing that you know that I've probably ever been through so then when he passed away it's like god at least he's not suffering no more yeah you know at least he's not you know miserable so that that kind of knowing that whenever I get bummed out kind of kind of helps right. you know Roger beyond you three boys it's amazing how many riders he helped and were influenced by him. Um, you know, we talk about Nick McFadden's birthday being today, but you know, obviously Jake Lewis, but even beyond Owensboro, I mean, he, he was involved in helping so many other riders that it, uh, it extended beyond your family for sure. And, and it just, he, he means that much to racing in this country. Um, it's just quite a legacy for him. And um, the one thing I want to say about, about Nikki that's become interesting is you know, you think about, we all, we all think about Kenny Roberts and, you know, what he's meant to us. And for the most part, we, some of us were able to see him race, but so many people that, that follow Kenny never saw him race in person, saw clips or whatever. And it, it's, it's going to be, and it's getting, it's getting to the point where it's going to be like that with Nikki. And you can see it's beyond having seen him race or knowing him or, 
you know, watching a clip of him, it's, it's bigger than that. It's, it's generations that are that younger kids that are told about Nikki Hayden, just like younger kids are told about, you know, Kenny or, or Wayne Rainey or, or Kevin Schwantz or any of these guys. It's like, it kind of continues through the generations and it's quite a legacy to, to, to Nikki in that six, nine day is going to continue for a long time because it's such a big thing and goes beyond a personal level. It's, it's, I think it's personal for people that didn't even know him personally. Right. I mean, it's, it's yeah, amazing. And that's the, the reason why we have the, the foundation and, you know, the six, nine day, cause you know, kids who are 10 years old or, or younger, or probably even, you know, even a little bit older than that, they're not going to know who Nikki is, but they're going to see, you know, somebody advertising the six, nine day and be like, who's, who's Nikki, you know, who's Nikki Hayden. And then, right. you know, going to, to look it up and then see, you know, what, what he was and, and who he was. And I think that's why that we have it. And, uh, you know, it's just to keep his, his legacy alive and, and, you know, when they come across something that somebody's donated to his foundation or the foundation helps somebody and they see it and then they're, they they want to see who it was and what he what he did and who he was. So I want to switch subjects a little bit here. We I, I, I checked in on seeing how your health is and it's good. And sorry about your shoulder issues with fishing, but um, I get that. Uh, but I got to ask you a question about King of the Baggers. Can we get you on one of those? Oh, I don't, I think I'm, I'm starting a little late in the game. I think for those guys, they got, you know, almost three years head start on me. And I didn't really realize when the King of the Baggers first came out, I honestly thought it was going to be like parade laps and right. like, you know, just cruising around. And then the first time I saw him, I was like, oh, God, this is not parade laps. This is serious business. You know, they're they are going so fast, you know. And, I mean, even at Road America, with the long straightaways, they weren't just light years behind the other classes and even quicker than some of them. So I don't – I would need a lot of practice because I'm not going to show up underprepared and, you know, run around and – embarrass myself but I definitely uh I'm not sure about that I think I started a little late and I'm not sure I still want to push the limits like those like those guys and girls are, are pushing the limits and beyond I mean just constantly stepping the game up it's not going to be before long I think somebody you know eventually is going to drag an elbow on the on the on the bagger and I'm not talking about when they crash because these guys are backing it in pushing the front like they were on the absolute limit you know the whole lap they're knocking five seconds off their lap times from the previous year at every track it's incredible how much faster they're going i don't even get it <laughs> i mean look at all the look at all what they put into it i mean those harley's constantly testing i mean they're testing more than any team in a paddock right now and then and Indian is testing as well so i mean it's like it's only going to continue to get better as these companies are actually like you know i mean and they're not testing on the street like they are going to race tracks and like taking this testing as serious as a super white team does yeah they're, they're serious for damn sure you know i don't i don't i don't recommend you doing that roger because i think uh i think that'd be harder on the shoulder than noodling <laughs> Oh, it'd be hard, especially one of those things. But right now, it feels really good. So, you know, I could probably get a weekend out of it at least. <laughs> yeah, sometimes all you need is a little rest with that thing, you know. So what's it been, yeah, three years, or, four years? There's, there's always a shot they can, you know, fix it up for a weekend. Right. Oh, all right, I, boys. I one quick. Sorry, Paul. I, yeah, go for it. Just because you mentioned the riding thing, Roger, I haven't asked you about this, but you do the uh, Ducati lap. You get on the V4S, I believe it is, and run around the track. Um, what's that like? Are you just cruising around? Are you trying to go fast? Um, what, what's what, do you do? You look forward to doing that when you do it. Yeah, I look forward to it. Uh, I, I try to go somewhat quick because you know you want it to kind of look real, but also only get one lap. So That's hard. Wow. It's really hard to to go that fast, you know, to really go fast. I mean, I don't have 
you know, I'm not racing, so I don't need to like, you know, take a bunch of risks to try to make a good uh, video on, on TV. So I try to go somewhat quick so it looks real, but I have one lap. And then I haven't rode since the previous race where I did one lap there. So it's kind of it's kind of hard to to get going too fast. <laughs> yeah, that's the hardest part when you haven't ridden in a while is the I mean it it takes a while just to get your brain used to going fast again and if you only get one lap it obviously doesn't get that chance and it definitely doesn't get it by the time you ride it again if when you haven't ridden it. So and I've actually kind of forgot like how fast we went. Like, right. you know, at Road Atlanta, when I came into that kink that I remember on a super bike that I held wide open, no problem. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I shut off big time now on the, right. on the Ducati and at Road America, like the straightaways, I was just like, dude, I am flying. And I guess because I haven't did it no more. And now I kind of brings it all back into perspective. Like these guys are, you know, just. It's impressive how they can do what they do. Yeah. Well. Okay, guys. Um, Roger, thanks for coming on. It's always fun to talk to you, and we'll obviously see you next week. And I think um, we probably listen to you more than anybody because when we're in that media center, it's you guys talking the entire time. It seems like twenty four seven. Sometimes I close my eyes at night when I'm in bed, and I still hear you. So. Yeah. Um, but telling his bedtime stories, Paul, is what he's doing. <laughs> exactly. But uh, you anyway, you, you, you've you done a tremendous job and you continue to do a tremendous job. And I'm, I'm proud of the way you've picked it up and, and kind of ran with it. It's, uh, it's nice that you're in the paddock and, and we wouldn't, the paddock wouldn't be the same without some Haydens in it. So it's good that you're there and uh, we appreciate all you do for, for the sport and for sticking up for us and having our back and all that good stuff. But uh, we will see you next week, and and Sean, also you next week. I know you've got something to say here about uh, about our marshalling issues, so why don't you go for it, and uh, and we'll talk again uh, next week. Yeah, we're trying to make a real push for this. One of the things that we try to do is um, we try to get about fifty five uh, marshals at each round, at, regardless of the length of the track. But obviously, at Road America, it was critical because it's such a long track, and you know you can put you can put more marshals there. But we put a big effort into uh, Ridge and getting some more marshals out there, involving some paid uh, positions as well um, for them. And we're going to do the same thing for Laguna Seca as well. And it sounds like we're going to be continuing to do it for the rest of the year. So you know, pay attention to that in terms of our social media and stories about it. But there will be lots of ways that you can contact our Chief Marshal David Hawley to uh, to essentially it's a volunteer thing. You just have to sign up, but they they will pay you depending on the position. And it's everything from, you know, if, it, if you're experienced, it's carrying it's holding a flag and recovering bikes. But if, if it's this is your first time, it, if it's a first time thing, it may not be a paid experience, but it might be a different sort of thing where you're down a, along pit road. Or, or things like that. So there's so many different areas and ways that you can help us in this series. And as I like to always say, it's it's the best seat in the house. You get so close to the riders um, and and the bikes that you're you're really part of the show. Um, you can see yourself or your fa family and your friends friends can see you on TV or whatever on Live Plus. But uh, you know, really become a part of that. It's a great way to to join us. And a lot of times, people that do join us in that realm end up, you know, getting involved and in becoming employees of Moto America. That happens a fair amount. Um, so if if it's something that you have a passion for doing, it, it's a great way to start and and get involved in Moto America and certainly road racing in general. And it, and it, it's a skill that you can use. At club for club races and all kinds of things. So um, it's just it's just a really fun and terrific thing to do if you've got a passion for racing like we all do. So I just wanted to put that out there. So for sure, um, coming up, uh, Laguna Seca, beautiful track. We love going there. Um, and even after that, when we get east again for Pittsburgh and New Jersey and Barber and and uh, some of those tracks as well. So um, please get involved with us. We'd love it. Thank you. All right, guys. Thanks very much. And I think it's. Now it actually is noon in Owensboro. <laughs> it is finally. All right, you guys have a good uh, have a good weekend. We'll talk to you next week. See you guys. All right, see you guys. Appreciate Thank, it. Thank you.